Amen. May be seated. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Amen. That's our anthem. What do you believe? Amen. What do you believe? Want to uh, do a couple things here before we get started this morning. First of all, to give a general apology to the church for last Sunday. I probably shouldn't have been up here, uh, but I was, and uh, uh, just want to give a general apology uh, to you. More specifically, though, if I offended anybody last Sunday and anything I might have said, please let me know, because to be honest with you, I don't know what I said. And if I said something that, no, truly, if I said something that, uh, that, that offended you, uh, I, I want to uh, sit down with you because uh, I would owe you an apology. Um, so, you know, just, just please let me know, okay? Please, please let me know. Oh, let's come before the Lord in prayer this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we give you glory. And we give you praise. And we thank you, Lord God, for being in our lives each day. We thank you, Lord, for your watchfulness over our lives, for keeping us in your care, for, for being with us each and every step of the way. Even when the mountains are high and the river is wide and, and the waters are rising, Lord, you're still with us. And we thank you for that. Now, Lord God, just pray and ask that you speak through me to the church this morning. And that all that is said will be glorifying to you. We come before you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Is anyone, well, it's a rhetorical question, I think. But maybe not everyone has. Is anyone, everyone pretty much has seen The Wizard of Oz. You've seen that, you've seen the movie, right? I remember as a little one, when I was, when I was little, uh, up until probably oh, just a few years ago, I would actually literally watch The Wizard of Oz like this, you know? Just not sure what's going to happen, and, and just, oh, I was scared, you know? We got that wicked witch of the, uh, was she the wicked witch of the east, the west, whichever one she was, and, and, you know, if you remember the story, Dorothy from Kansas gets caught up in a tornado, and... And uh, then her land, or her house falls in the middle of the land of Oz, and she lands on the one wicked witch, and her sister's mad, and, and so she has all these flying monkeys. I hated those flying monkeys. You remember those flying monkeys? And see, when I was growing up, it was in black and white, and that was probably actually worse than what it is in color, you know. But it, watch that in black and white, and, and I was just, I was scared. I didn't like that. And then, uh, you know, I'm burning, I'm burning, or not melting, whatever she was doing, you know. She, but, you know, the, the whole goal was for Dorothy and the Tin Man and the Scarecrow and the Lion to make it to the Land of Oz to see the wizard. They had to go see the wizard. And, and you know, you remember, you remember if you saw the movie, when you saw the movie, they'd walk in and, and, and he was giant. I mean, he was, you know, it was smoke coming up and he was just with some big head up there and just rumblings and thunders and crashings and all that kind of stuff. And then Dorothy had this little dog named Toto. Remember Toto? Toto then, one time when they were there with the wizard, Toto ran and, and pulled the curtain back. And you saw this man there just running these controls. And he wasn't some big, mighty, powerful person or wizard. He was just a man. But sometimes I just wonder, in the church, do we, do we look at God that way? Do we look at God as if though he is just, just some kind of a man just kind of running things behind the scenes, behind the curtain maybe, and when the curtain's pulled back, that's just a man, it's not some great mighty being that we've always heard about. I believe, I believe so often, I know the secular world out there really believes that's who God is, you know, just some man up there in the sky perhaps, you know, and and uh, just running some kind of machines. But what concerns me is within the church, within the church, what do you believe in the power of God? Do you believe in the almighty God that sits on the throne, that created this entire universe that we live in? Or is he just some man up in the sky 
and you just come to the church on Sunday mornings just to just 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 to be together with a group of people and maybe hear a sermon and sing a few songs and have a prayer or two and that'd be your fix for the week. How do you envision? How, how do you envision God? Job, Job, uh, after he went through this entire ordeal, he says in the 42nd chapter, he says, My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself. I despise myself and repent in sackcloth and ashes. He says, I've, I've heard of you. But now I've seen you, and I despise myself. To be in the actual presence of Almighty God, for what God was able to reveal to, to Job without Job dying, that's what Job saw with his eyes. He heard of God, but God actually revealed himself to Job. And when God revealed himself to Job, Job just simply says, I despise myself. I despise myself. When we take a look at uh, Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, the sixth chapter, in our readings for this morning, and here's what Isaiah writes. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. Two, with two wings he covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe is me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. Isaiah had an opportunity, likewise, to have an experience, a one-on-one -on -one experience with the Lord. And he says that he was in the temple, and he, was, he went to the temple probably just like this. We don't know a whole lot about Isaiah in his life. Don't know if he was a priest or if he was just someone sitting within the temple area worshiping God on a particular Sabbath day. We don't really know for sure. But on this particular Sabbath, or on this particular day that he's in the temple, he said that, he said, I saw the Lord, and he was high and lifted up. Now, I'm just kind of thinking and wondering, as if perchance Isaiah is there in the, in the temple just to worship God, and maybe he's seated just as you're seated right now, and he's maybe not even hearing what the priests have to say. Rather, God has come down and God has touched Isaiah's life because Isaiah has, a, has something that God wants him to do. God wants Isaiah to be a prophet. And, and God now has touched him. So I can just envision Isaiah sitting here just like you're sitting there. You may not, may not be paying attention to me, which is fine, because God is talking to you this morning. Maybe, maybe the experience is not with Mike, but it's with you and God. And you're sitting there tonight, or this morning, just like perhaps Isaiah was, and having that one-on-one -on -one experience with God. And you're not hearing the thing I'm saying, that's okay. But he said he saw the Lord. He said he was high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. And there were seraphim. With two of the wings that covered their eyes. Two of the wings they covered their feet. And with two of the wings they flew. Saying, holy, holy, holy is Lord God Almighty. And it says that it's the place shook. The place literally shook. Is God getting your attention this morning? Is there something that God wants you to do? You know, we're living in a corrupt land right now. The people during Isaiah's time, they were corrupt. And Isaiah had to have a message uh, to give to them. And God gave him the message. When you read back in the earlier chapters of Isaiah, things were not well. 
for Judah, the southern kingdom. And God chose Isaiah to speak through him and give him a message for the people. And his response, his response, he says, woe is me. Woe is me. I like the way King James puts it. Woe is me, for I am undone. What Isaiah is saying is, woe is me, I deserve to die. I am in the literal presence of God himself. And I should be struck down. I should fall down as dead. Woe is me, for I am undone. I am undone. He says, I am a man of unclean lips. You and your Christian walk. Perhaps you are like Isaiah. Perhaps you are a person this morning with unclean lips. And maybe you need to be going around as the lepers because those who were unclean back in this time, and even back in the time of Jesus, had to march around anytime they were going someplace and they saw some people. They would have to yell out, unclean, unclean. Perhaps you as a Christian feel unclean this morning. Unclean in your life, maybe not in your speech, but maybe in the things that you do in your life on a daily basis. The places you go, the things that you see, the thoughts that you have. Are you unclean? Moses, when we look at Exodus chapter 3, had an experience. In Exodus chapter 3, we read that Moses is out to just tending the, the flock of his father-in-law Jethro. And as he's tending the flock, he sees this, in the distance, this bush that's burning. And he approaches this bush to see exactly what's going on. Because I'm sure Moses has never seen anything just quite like that before. Not knowing what to expect. And all of a sudden, Moses hears a voice telling him to stop and to remove his sandals for the place that he is standing is holy ground. And we read in Exodus, the third chapter, this conversation that Moses has with God himself, that he is literally in the presence of God. God this time is taking, taking the, 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 uh, the, the position of a burning bush because that is all Moses could see without dying. But Moses is having the conversation with God. And God has a task for Moses to do. To go back to Egypt and to free his people. He's heard the cries of his children. In Acts chapter 9, we read of a man walking along the road. He's been given a commission by the, by the priests and by the Pharisees and by the scribes to go to Damascus and to arrest those people who were followers of the way. And he's walking along this road and all of a sudden a bright, brilliant light shines in his face and he falls to the ground. It says that those who were, who were with him just stood there. They heard but they thought it was just a roar of thunder. And they see this man named Saul of Tarsus face down on the ground in the presence of Almighty God, though they didn't know that it was Almighty God. And, and, and Saul has this conversation with the Lord saying, Who are you? And Jesus goes on to explain that I'm the one that you're persecuting. He says, Now go to Damascus. I have, I have something for you to do. So the light goes away. Paul gets up, he's blind, and then people have to lead him into the city. Where he's three days in fasting and prayer before a man named Ananias comes and touches him 
and the scales fall off his eyes, and he can see. He's thinking this week, oh, woe is me, for I am undone. I am undone. Uh, who am I and that, that, that God would love me so much that he would send his only son to die for my <coughs> sins. I am undone. I am not worthy to be in the presence of God. But by the grace of God and by his mercies and by his love, we can come before the throne of God. Maybe you've been a Christian a long time. And maybe this morning, God is talking to you because there's something that He wants you to do. But you perhaps don't feel as if though you're worthy. And you're not. But you're available. He has something he wants you to do. And he's calling your name. And he's going to show you something. Words to say or things to do. Maybe to go out into a mission field. Or maybe to stand up behind a pulpit. Or maybe to get a microphone and sing a song. Something that's going to bring him glory and honor. But he's calling upon you this morning. He's calling your name. Maybe you don't know him yet as your Lord and Savior. He's calling your name. <laughs> he wants you to repent of your sins. And he wants to be your personal Savior this morning. You just need to respond to his call. Whatever that may be, Isaiah, when we read back in that sixth chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah hears God speaking. He says, who are we going to send? Who will go before us? Who's going to go and proclaim the word, my message to the people? And I can envision Isaiah sitting out in the crowd like this and saying, here am I, Send me. Here am I. Send me. What does God want you to do? What does He want you to do? Even as Christians, we are not worthy. As I was mentioning just a second ago. The Apostle Paul in the seventh chapter of uh, Romans, the Apostle Paul says, oh, what a wretched man I am. This is the Apostle Paul now. This is the man who was converted on the road to Damascus, who is now a follower of Jesus Christ, the one he persecuted. The man who went on the mission trips around the, around the world sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. He talks about the sin that's in his life, the sin that's plaguing him, and the sin that plagues us. He says, oh, what a wretched man I am. Who can save me? And he gives us the answer, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. That's who can save you. Oh, but I'm a man of unclean lips. Woe is me. Woe is me. Woe is me. It's hard sometimes, isn't it, to describe the love that Jesus has for us. Because our worthiness, when we look at our righteousness, 
We may look at our neighbors and think, well, boy, I'm more righteous than what that person is. Because we can all hold up a yardstick and make a comparison, you know, with somebody else and say, I'm not as bad as that person or I'm just as good as that person. But when your righteousness is compared to the righteousness of God, none of us, none of us are righteous enough. All of our sins, all that we've ever done is just like filthy rags in the sight of God. But yet, but yet, he's calling on you to have a personal relationship with him. He's calling on you to be his messenger. We read in Matthew chapter 28 of the Great Commission where each and every one of us have been called to go out and make disciples for Jesus Christ. Every one of us, where is God calling you this morning. You can say, oh, woe is me, for I am undone. And I'm a person of unclean lips. And you can say, I live among a people of unclean lips. But don't forget the rest of the story <coughs> of your availability. And say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Let's pray. Our Father, we give you thanks for this morning's hour. And, oh Lord, just uh, pray and ask that someone here in this church this morning that you will ignite in their life, Lord, a new burning desire to serve you. Even in their unworthiness, you're calling them. Even in that Thank you. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I do believe this morning God's calling someone this morning to step out. To step out and make a difference for the kingdom. I just believe someone here today, this morning. Don't know in what capacity, don't know how. But you're going to rock people's lives. You'll do something great for God. And I'm excited. I'm excited. We're going to watch it happen. <clears throat> and whoever you are and whatever it is, this church is going to support you in that. So put your seatbelts on and hang on. It's coming. It's coming.